I I put this for my own record as well in the future when I go through slides that I've given before I will remember this was the virtual ICLR hopefully the only one that will be virtual um, for the foreseeable future I hope everyone is doing okay I'm personally it, I'm, it's 5 p.m. where I live I live in London UK and today is a pretty rainy day so otherwise we will be sharing we will be sharing like much more than um, than the slides but uh, you know hopefully that still create some social aspect that will be good for later discussions and um, I'm going to be giving the first talk so um, I thought I would switch a bit the the two words that this social is about the generalization and, and generative models and actually I think hopefully I can manage to explain um, kind of the three main points that were given in the social description which is uh, generation by neural networks, generalization by neural networks, and then data augmentation for neural networks. So in my keynote, I'll actually try to cover these three areas. I think there's some interesting connections that flow, make the, the talk flow reasonably well from the first to the second to the third. And so let's begin with perhaps, you know, generation by neural networks. And you know, generative models, um, some people confuse it or like uh, use unsupervised learning as well to refer to the same kind of set of techniques. But um, in this talk and maybe in the whole social, although we'll see about um, other talks, I think um, I understand a generative model by a model that can, you know, obviously be parameterized with parameters and, and um, maybe perhaps has a data set from which you can sample, etc. It's a model that um, all it, all we're going to ask it to do is to kind of get a sample of some data modality of interest. And that's kind of, for me, when I think of a generative model, that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind. So um, this is obviously the tweet that, um, you know, Prabhu did earlier. And it, there's a bunch of modalities in text and, and some video slash images here that we can see. So, you know, the dream perhaps of generative models is to be able to as we generate um, data modalities um, every day, um, could models generate these modalities as well? Um, there's some background noise. I don't know if everyone is muted, but anyways, um, it's, it's potentially distracting for others. So um, let's dive a bit into what this model um, is. And in general, we are interested in neural networks because they're quite high capacity expressive models to generate high dimensional modalities such as um, images, videos, and text. So I took this slide from Aaron, who is a, a colleague at DeepMind, and he basically characterizes um, the model part of the equation by essentially like four categories. Um, the, fir the first kinds of models are those that are called latent variable models, and famous examples, probably VA is the one that everyone still kind of uses and researches on um, these days. The second one is, an, is what I call implicit models that, um, you know, famously GANs are part of. Um, and I'll describe a bit more, not only in references, but also on kind of superficially what these models differ on. <clears throat> the third one is transform, transformation-based models. Um, so real MVP or NICE, and I think we actually um, have a keynote at XLR talking precisely about these kind of um, you know, flow-based models. So this is a, maybe the third family. And last but not least, and certainly one that I actually have uh, quite done a lot of work is uh, autoregressive models um, or so-called fully observed models. So there's like a lot of early work here and also some more recent work um, such as pixel RNNs, WaveNet, pixel snail, and I guess GPT-2 would fall into this category as well. So there's a bunch of tutorials. These are fairly old because this slide is, is, is slightly outdated. Um, but that, let me actually try to explain a bit more, unpack a bit more for you these four categories, um, or really three, depends on how you look at that, those. So the first one, um, which is the last one in the last slide actually, is, is autoregressive or fully observed models. So these, remember, we're trying to model a multidimensional complicated data modality. So these kind of models, assume that you're going to observe every pixel or every word or every character in a sequence and so on. And there will, they generally um, model the distribution, like the probability distribution of this data so that you can sample from, for example, um, generally in 
an autoregressive fashion by using the chain rule of probability. So these models generally will try to model all the random variables involved in a modality by simply using the chain rule um, like this. And then, you know, you train these models and then you can sample from them and generally you just maximize the likelihood of some given data set. The second category of models does something slightly different. Um, it does not necessarily, although some variants do that, it does not necessarily decompose X um, via the chain rule like before, but it actually assumes there are some latent variables or there are some factors um, that are not observable Z. Um, and these can be just Gaussian, a Gaussian prior or, or, or Gaussian noise from which you can then transform this simple distribution onto the real data distribution X. And um, the transformation kind of models and also a latent variable models such as BAEs adopt this. And then how they actually infer Z from X um, changes depending on the flavor of the model, right? So there's lots of um, interesting work on this area. And then the last one is perhaps maybe the most famous um, from the last few years, certainly the most researched upon, which are implicit models from which GAN is the maybe the major example. And so in GANs, what you do is generally you infer X from Z and then you score X based on just essentially trying to classify whether samples come from the real distribution or not. There are some interesting variants of GANs where you try to also infer Z from X, um, like by GANs being the, the notorious example for that. But generally, like that's that's um, GANs only deal with the slice um, from Z to X, um, as we know. So there's an interesting kind of characterization that I put together here um, that tells us a bit, you know, pros and cons of these um, three or four, depending if you count transformation-based models in its own category, like Aaron does. But I generally like to just not do that. So, um, you know, fully observed models we know that the advantages are that evaluating likelihood is very simple. It's using the chain rule of probability, it's tractable. Um, and sampling is also simple, but it's actually quite expensive because you need to generate one sample one after the other. And then extracting some sort of representation is kind of impossible or quite hard. Although whatever you see hard or impossible in this table, it means that there's generally some research going on and actually um, perhaps the greatest breakthrough of these fully observed models has been BERT. So we can say BERT is a good way to extract a representation from a fully observed model. Um, now, latent models have different trade-offs. So sampling is actually um, exact and quite cheap. So that's, that's always a desirable property of these kind of models. And that's why to do things like text-to-speech, you first train a fully observed model WaveNet, but then you actually distill it into a just feedforward model, essentially. Um, and then the last one, which are, um, let's say, GANs, in, you know, simplifying a bit, um, it's kind of quite hard or impossible to evaluate P of X. Um, it's, again, very simple um, and cheap to sample samples from, from the, the distribution that implicitly these models learn. And again, extracting some representation is a bit hard. Although, again, there's a very great paper that uses these ideas of um, big by, by GANs, which reverse, um, and instead of going from Z to X, go from X to Z, and finds that the representations learned are useful for image net classification and so on. And then a the last category, this is more like maybe feature learning in general as well, as uh, generative models as understood as I want a sample from the model, just give me samples and I'm happy. Um, but there's actually a fourth category that's gained a lot of popularity recently, so I thought it would be interesting to mention, which is that of um, unsupervised feature learning or semi, you know, self-supervised learning. There's many names people have given these. Um, a lot of these methods right now are using contrastive losses, and thanks to these losses, they're training features. Um, they're extracting some representations from which training, um, uh, let's say, a linear classifier on ImageNet from no labels um, is very, very simple, and we've, we've seen a lot of progress and interesting results, and models like MoCo, CPC, and SimClear are examples of the last category, which I'm not going to describe more than just giving you in the table so that you can see the full picture, perhaps, of feature learning in general from data distributions.
So that brings me to like, okay, that's the model categorizations. Let's, let's look a bit at generalization. Um, and I think the best examples of generative models that actually do generalize is that of conditional generative models, right? So um, machine translation is perhaps one of the examples that comes to mind first, um, in, in, at least in, in what I've, I've worked on in the past, which is, um, you know, it generates text from a different language, right? And so it, it, you can code like, let's say I don't speak Chinese, so I wanna translate from Chinese to English. And this is a generative model. It, it, you sample or you decode from the models um, conditional distribution P of Y, um, English given X, Chinese characters. Um, and then, you know, you, you just, this is actually what's driving most of the translation, um, big translation uh, frameworks um, that are used in, you know, by, by many of the big companies, right? So, you know, generative models really actually do generalize and they're used every day and they're obviously used in circumstances that go beyond the training distribution. They're obviously not perfect, but these are kind of the, one of the best models we have right now is actually a generative model um, based on, on just essentially sequence learning, right? So there's, you know, this is an obvious example. The other one that, that obviously um, was, has been mentioned as well in, in the introduction is, you know, transferring from uh, text to speech. So this is kind of the same principles. You give a few characters, so it's a conditional generative model again, but given a few characters, you can generate audio and this is how um, your Google Assistant talks to you, for example. So again, used by many and, and generalizes quite well. And then there's other applications, which, um, you know, we've seen in the last few years are very impressive kind of computer vision generative model. So, so you're using a generative model to help you kind of create modalities or transfer modalities. And there's quite a few examples. I'm gonna just show you a few that I think are, have been quite remarkable um, in the last few years, right? So um, obviously, um, given an image, you can generate another image that relates to the input image, right? So in this case, you make a caricature out of an image. This is a fairly early work, right? It's 2017. Um, we all seen these kind of examples of transforming zebras onto horses. So I think this is a nice example of generalization, right? You train your model to, to, to do this, you know, image to image translation, but at best time you are gonna give an image that it hasn't seen. And we can see these models generally work reasonably well, although it might be a bit harder to characterize their generalization capabilities because this is a bit of a task that it's, it's just more on the creative side, let's say. Um, there's also interesting applications for what's called sim to real in robotics. It's very common to be able to access a good simulator. These simulators don't tend to look so photorealistic as the real images that the robot would do would, would see. So then one obvious thing you could try to do is again generate or regenerate these images onto something that looks even closer to reality. And there's a lot of interesting work um, on this kind of domain adaptation for these tasks as well. And then all sorts of other things, uh, very creative usage of generative models um, to do like super, resolu super resolution of images. This is another example of super resolution from Angela and all at all that is not exactly on images, but it's on these kind of meshes that you can extract with partial scans that are a bit noisy. And you can see how generative models also help you kind of impaint um, and reconstruct these, these gaps, right? So, so also very impressive stuff. And then, you know, going kind of a bit to kind of what has happened um, in generative models of modalities, um, before going on to images, I would also want to mention, because there's been quite a lot of progress in text, that, you know, generating, um, generating samples from a model is something that's been done for quite a while. Actually, if you, if you read the paper from Shannon um, from, from a while back, you can kind of see that he's describing a, a procedure for sampling from an n-gram model um you know how kind of how english language could look like and in fact the slp book has a few samples that um train a three gram model and you can see here like this is kind of not not very good text but that was of, of course like this is a fairly old procedure right to to train these models and then sample from them and then ever since this um we've had a few kind of leaps in quality um you know Ilya had a nice paper that actually made me go into recurrent neural networks that train a language model um and 
sample from it and the samples reason look much more realistic than the, those that you would get from engram models and then later on with lstms and bigger models you got like single sentence that started to look like you could you could believe this was written by someone right the sample that you get from the model was fairly realistic and then um, in 2018 with the introduction of transformers actually Liu et al had a very nice paper on summarization but actually they had also very nice samples where you sat, you condition your model on the title of a wikipedia article and then the the model kind of generates the whole article in and it's fairly you know consistent long term and 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 reasonably good and perhaps the example if if anything the only one that you've heard about is probably gpt2 which again um, is a model trained on a lot of text and then notably it, it generates samples that you know they're again leaping forward even more um, what was able to be done with you know language models in the past right so this clearly has seen a lot of advances and beyond that um, I keep I expect to keep seeing more and more um, higher quality samples from the next generation models now in images the story is fairly similar so I'm not gonna you know expand too much on this but actually um, not even from the GAN paper, but but actually Marco Aurelio had a very nice paper in 2011 where he already was kind of generating faces right from a data set of faces. Um, then, you know, there were back in the day, like interesting generative models from RAS actually on, you know, trees, rockets and, and you know, like apples, women, all sorts of different classes. And you could kind of see that statistically it started to look like the image that they were representing very interesting work also on generative models of textures right which are slightly less perhaps complicated than you know full images statistically speaking and then moving forward we know that um you know from the gans but also marco Aurelio's paper should also have been included here um we've seen a tremendous advance in the quality of samples we're getting from from generative models and gans have definitely taken here the lead in terms of showing this progression so um, the last maybe inception of GAN models that are very impressive. Um, so these are big GANs, which, um, you know, the, the images really look, you know, real. And of course, the question is, are they just copying from the data set? There's a lot of interesting questions around the evaluation, which I actually will get to for the third part of the talk. Um, style GAN too, this, this, is, this is kind of almost unbelievable, like kind of the quality that you're getting to do like this advanced, um, you know, image processing where you can get kind of you can mix two people and see what the result looks like and i mean this 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 is this is like really like um testament that you know generalization for for generative models um even if it's not clear how to quantify it it really has um, performed astonishingly well and and the applications for all these kind of uh, image transformation and processing um and uh, you know kind of augmented by neural networks I think we're just seeing the surface and, and it's really interesting to kind of be in this case just witnessing how the field is advancing right but as I said besides kind of nice samples and possibly like augmenting Photoshop and so on with these tools um, there's been a realization that just kind of assessing the quality of these models is actually quite hard and if you think about it even for GPT-2 and so on um, to have a metric that tells us is this sample um, is this text really kind of written or as if it was written by a human it's almost like solving um, the Turing test for either text or images right you, we would need to have a scoring function that unless we can ask humans to rate the the samples which many people are doing you know that problem feels as hard as the problem of generating samples to begin with so there was a very interesting paper by Lucas presented at ICLR actually, I believe it was um, in 2015, so a very early ICLR, which kind of it was thought provoking saying that all these kind of metrics that people use to, oh, my model is not overfitting or um, likelihood is a good metric or we should look at all the other sort of metrics for image generation, that all these metrics can be kind of gamed. And so there's no really like a, a very good metric to assess kind of how good the generative models are um, that is widely still like I would say accepted in the community and that's fine because that makes it a research topic in itself right the metric um, in which you can measure this so you know if you've followed a bit like progress in GANs there's 
two metrics. Um, and I think one thing that many people have argued is um, using maybe the last part, the third part of the talk, like the data augmentation for neural networks. So using this precisely as a metric for assessing how good of a generating a generative model you have. And this is actually a fairly, fairly simple idea. The idea is so simple, right? That it can be presented in one slide. Imagine, um, you know, you, you have a big gun model. This is a generative model that goes from the noise to the image modality, and it also conditions on the class. And you just train a big gun model on the full image net data set. This is a data set of um, 1 million images of 1,000 classes. And, you know, you do that, you get samples from it, and you are happy. But maybe the question here is, is this model from which I can sample essentially a training set of equal characteristics than the, the original training set, would this training set that I generate fully from the big gun model, would it create a classifier that would generalize to the real test set or validation set of ImageNet, right? So you take your training set, you train your generative model, you throw away your training set, you have your generative model, and you start sampling from it, and you create a new training set, um, which is now only coming from by guy big gun um, samples with its, with its uh, classes, of course. And then you go and you train your ResNet favorite model for ImageNet, you train this, and then you measure your metric of interest is how well does this model train on fake samples or samples from, from the model um, that does on real images from the validation set of ImageNet. And so many people realize this is a reasonable metric actually, and it obviously would, pushing this metric forward would also implicitly make these models that we wish to use for data augmentation potentially, um, you know, be useful, right? Because we would then be able to generate instead of a million images, 10 million images, and then great, right? We have a much larger data set, which probably will, um, will be better in terms of generalization if these, um, if the, if these samples are diverse and so on. It's a data augmentation technique. And so we did a fairly um, wide study on this on a paper that was presented just near Rips 2019 um, last year. And we took kind of standard, kind of very well, like good looking state of the art models like BIGAN, BQBIE, and, and this model, Hercule uh, Auto Regressive. And we just tested this idea, right, um, on the very latest state of the art models. So real data, right, if you don't do any replacement, um, the ResNet 50 gets, let's say, 76% top one accuracy and a very high inception score and a very low FID. So here lower is better, here higher is better, and of course accuracy higher is better. So if you had to guess, um, if we, using the procedure that I described, what does Big Gun or BQBA do? Um, I actually, I actually must say, it was both unimpressive and impressive to see these numbers. So what you actually get is well, first, much lower accuracy. So you, you train a classifier that's not nearly as accurate as a state of the art. But I think at the same time, this is impressive, right? Because you, you now have a generative model and by training on it, so, solely on it, no, no real data use, you can actually get 55% top one accuracy, which is of course, you know, almost Alex net levels. So it's, it's a fairly like good um, model trained on these kind of samples, right? So you know, these numbers are, of course, there's work to be done to make this accuracy, sorry, um, as good as the maybe the real data or perhaps surpass it uh, if we are wishing to use this for data augmentation. But I, I mean, at the same time, obviously, um, there's a still like, um, you know, the, it's much better like than chance, right? That, that would be like one over a thousand. And it also tells you that the metrics used, you know, when you see inception scores and FIDs, you might think big guns are, the samples are better, but actually to train a classifier, it turns out that for in, in this particular case, BQBAE seems to be better. And the cool thing about this metric is that we're starting to be able to train a classifier because of course, this requires you to train a classifier from scratch, from, from, from you know, a new data set that you create, that you sample, right? But it turns out that it takes less than a day and you know, 10 or $20 to actually train a classifier uh, on ImageNet nowadays. So as a metric, it starts to be feasible for people to use it. And of course, hopefully big corporations are happy to help academics to you know, evaluate their models using this kind of metric that takes a while to compute, like 10 hours. It's not, I mean, it's not a small amount of time. 
So this allows you to do things like all looking at, you know, big gun, um, for instance, these are the classes that train a classifier that is actually better than real training data. So perhaps it really understood these two particular classes in the data set. And then also you can look at what are the classes that really, you know, you, you, you sample a thousand classes, you train a classifier and it just doesn't you generalize at all to the test set, right? So you can see um, for balloons, it kind of, there, you could believe there's balloons here, but it's a fairly bad sample. So even to detect sample quality, this metric um, is fairly reasonable, I would say. So in summary, I tried to kind of cover a bit the, the three themes um, of these, uh, you know, of, of these social events. Um, I think generation um, by neural networks, there's a few model categories that one could study and fully observe latent and implicit is what we just briefly discussed. Generalization in neural networks is happening. I mean, we have a lot of tasks and applications that are actually hitting production systems in language, to speech, you know, image, domain transfer, robotics. And last but not least, data augmentation um, that would be serving a purpose for neural networks. Um, I would say state-of-the-art models still are not helping um, in creating new data from which you know, a better classifier could be trained. So with that, I think we might have a time for like one question or so, but all, otherwise we can obviously do these questions during the breakout. So thank you very much. I hope my voice, I mean, I, I have no, no clue if the, the talk was working all the time, but I hope it was. Otherwise I've been talking to myself. Maybe we have time for one question. And Great. Quinton posted a question. Maybe he can ask if he wants. Hey, Oreo. That hey. was a great talk. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I have one question. So you talked about the latent variable model at the beginning. And then one of the yeah. advantages that you pointed out was the that it was easy to extract the feature latent vector. But I guess we need to somehow Clar uh, you know, uh, it would be nice if you could clarify what it means to actually extract the latent vector from the latent variable model. Is If it's a correct, let's say, true posterior inference, then it's as difficult as anything else, right? But I guess you mean that the, uh, like the approximate posterior mean is fine. So what did you mean by the, right, right. By the extraction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, so that's true. Like when you train a BAE, um, you have a model that maps from the modality to the latent. Um, but that's just to approximate the the elbow and and so on, right? But mm -hmm. um, at at the very least, um, that neural network can also be repurposed to extract um, a feature or like what are the latent factors that this image would be condensed as that then the decoder can go ahead and regenerate it um, using mm -hmm. the usual like KL trick, right? So. Um, it's not clear that those features will be any good for classification, mm -hmm. say, but it, at least it's an easy way to see how it would work, right? If the latent variables mm -hmm. that your BAE encodes happen to be the ImageNet class, then you're in business. Mm -hmm. your, your latent is actually the, the class label, so mm -hmm. you, you, you can just simply classify that, right? But mm -hmm. of course, you know, not every, thing, not every BAE model has very meaningful mm -hmm. latent variables. Um, and, you know, I, 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 as I was saying, um, semi-supervised learning or self-supervised learning and so on are great fields to also look at for the tricks that make these models better at extracting meaningful, meaningful features from the latents. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Well, okay, thank you, Oriol, for the that. wonderful talk. All right, thank you very much. I'm not sure I can stop sharing this, I think. I, yeah, yeah, and I, I'll admit myself as well. Yeah, so maybe Philip can set up his screen. Meanwhile, sure. Should I start yeah, sharing yeah. my screen? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, maybe maybe I I'll give a short introduction and then you can start. Okay, same So same. yeah, so Philip is currently a professor at MIT CSA Lab. So he was previously at OpenAI and was uh, primarily associated with UC Berkeley. He, his research also spans generative models, transfer learning, few short learning. So today's talk of his will be based on like few short learning and how the benchmarking problem works. So yeah, Philip, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, 
So I won't talk about few shot learning actually. That might have been a different talk, um, but that's okay. Um, yeah, thanks for organizing. I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yeah, okay. Great. So I'm going to talk about this, this view of generative models as um, a kind of data visualization. Um, and this kind of gets at what Ordell was just talking about. You know, what is, what's the point of a generative model? And there's a lot of ideas out there, representation learning, uh, prediction, just making pretty images. Uh, but I think that one that might be a little bit overlooked is uh, what kind of visualizations of data you can achieve with generative models. Okay, so the idea is that, well, if you take a big data set of images, um, there are some sparse set of samples in data space. Uh, and what a generative model does is it kind of fills in all the gaps of what one of these like latent variable models or implicit generative models does. And you know, a lot of people have shown great sampled images from these celebrity faces or Flickr HQ faces. Um, and those are cool, but I think that's kind of the least interesting thing you could do with the generative model is just to make more data samples. Uh, because we already have the data set and you already have a way of just getting in a lot of random faces. You can just Google faces. What's a lot more impressive is to get a result like this. Um, where you actually filled in the gaps in between the faces. And in the generative model, you went from these sparse data samples to this visualization of the entire manifold of kind of face reality. So I'm gonna um, be talking about generative models that map from some uh, latent variable Z to a data distribution. Um, I'll be presenting two models that are based on GANs, but you could also do this with VAEs or um, other models that have some latent variables. And the way that they work, as you know, we're probably familiar with, is you pass your random noise sample through a um, neural network, and then it makes an image. And that image lies somewhere on uh, the manifold of natural images. Um, we sample another Z, it uh, lies somewhere else on the, the manifold of natural images. So we can think of this as transforming some prior distribution, the Gaussian noise, into this more complicated distribution. And what's really cool um, is that this latent space ends up kind of organizing uh, the data space. Okay, so we can draw random samples, but what's even better is that we have this mapping between the latent variable Z and the data X. Uh, so what people have seen in a lot of these models is, is that if you do some simple um, transformation in latent space, like walking on a line, it corresponds to something that looks meaningful in data space. Okay, so uh, here's an example from BigGAN where you can interpolate in Z space between a, this bluebird and this fly, and every uh, image that you pass through looks kind of reasonable. Okay, so that transformation doesn't actually exist in nature, but nonetheless, it looks like we have observed something that is plausibly physical. So what we wanted to ask is, um, so these generative models are interpolating and creating this underlying kind of physical continuum, but we have another way of doing that too, which is just to use a graphics engine. That is a generative model of visual data, which has all these really cool properties. You can move the camera around, change the lighting. Um, so are we getting anything new out of these models? Uh, and how close are they to having the capabilities of traditional graphics, which are one of the powerful ways of visualizing um, you know, the world? So I'm going to talk about two little papers on this. Um, the first one is actually an iClear paper, which uh, we're also presenting like at the end of this hour, I think. Um, so this is on the steerability of generative adversarial networks. And this is work that um, Ali and Lucy did. And we just wanted to ask, let's see if a GAN um, in latent space can model you know, the most basic transformations that a game engine could model, like a camera transformation or a lighting change. So how 
close as a GAN to this kind of classic graphics engine. And the way it works, uh, the way we tried this is really simple. Uh, we just looked for paths in latent space that correspond to um, some image transformation. Uh, in particular, we focused on linear paths. So we start with some um, Z vector and we add a vector W and we walk in amount alpha. And that should correspond to um, moving somewhere in image space. And where do we want to move? Well, we can define um, target transformations. So for example, we can say uh, we want uh, a vector w to correspond to shifting the flower up to the top of the image. And we do that by setting the target to be the translated flower up from the top of the image. OK, so here's the objective. We search for a direction w in latent space that matches some edit operation in image space. That edit could be uh, shifting the pixels. It could be zooming in on the pixels. It could be rotating them. Any kind of image operation you want to define. OK, so um, this is really inspired by things like word to vec where in the latent space uh, or the representational space of a word representation model, uh, people found this you know, very striking thing that there exist directions that correspond to semantics. Uh, for example, there's a direction that corresponds to um, the tense of a verb, walking goes to walk in the same direction as swimming goes to swam. So here, here we're essentially asking, are there um, directions in the latent space of a GAN that correspond to simple image transformations like zooming in or rotating a photo? Uh, so we did that optimization, and indeed you can find a direction that corresponds to zooming in on the cat or shifting the cat left and right, uh, brightening this image, uh, darkening this image. Of course, you notice that there's something weird that happens where the volcano explodes because that's kind of the, the semantics that has been learned from the data. OK, so we've visualized something about the data distribution on which this model was trained uh, by doing this. Uh, so we wanted to go a little bit further. We can achieve these transformations in latent space, uh, but what can we learn about uh, the model and the data by looking at these transformations? So we took um, an example like this hot air balloon, and we tried to shift it upward by walking in the shift y coordinate up direction in latent space. And this is what happens. So you can see that the balloon does go up, and we can also shift it down. But it kind of forms this you know, sigmoid curve. It looks like it kind of gets stuck at the edges of the image. You can, you can see that for a lot of different transformations. For example, if I zoom in on this cat, initially it works. I can get closer to the cat. But eventually, it gets stuck. You just can't zoom in too far on a cat. Um, on this pizza at the bottom, we tried to rotate it. And it can rotate it very slightly. But again, it gets stuck, and it can't rotate it more than a few degrees. So why is that happening? And our hypothesis is that this is related to the, um, the data that ha the model has been trained on. So if the model's never seen a super zoomed in cat, of course, they can't learn how to generate a super zoomed in cat. And this is a kind of a way of visualizing the biases and limitations in the data. Um, so there's a lot more details in the paper, but I'll just mention uh, two uh, results. So we did try to quantify the relationship between the um, distribution of data and the ability for the model to achieve these transformations. So on the x-axis here, we have the variance of an attribute, the zoom attribute in the data. So we measured on uh, what's the variance of how zoomed in a cat face is, for example. Uh, we can just use an object detector to detect the size of the cat face. And on the y-axis, we have uh, how well was the model, the GAN, able to um, shift the zoom variable. So if we walk in this direction corresponding to zooming in and out, how large a transformation is achieved. And there's a decent correlation between those two things. Um, here are two example points. We have the robin and the laptop. And the laptop is an object that comes in a lot of different sizes in the uh, training data, which is ImageNet. The robin only comes in one canonical pose. And as you can see, uh, it's possible to zoom in on the laptop, but not the robin, uh, reflecting these biases in the data set. Uh, 
you can get kind of similar things with color biases. Uh, if I try to walk in a direction that goes toward redness um, in latent space, uh, you can make a car, uh, oh, sorry, toward blueness, you can make a car go from red to blue, but you can't make a fire truck turn blue. And of course, the reason is because there are no blue fire trucks in the data set. Uh, so this is kind of a way of visualizing properties of the data and maybe also interesting to look at as a evaluation metric for the capabilities of a generative model. Uh, to what degree did the generative model generalize to be able to do things like paint a fire truck blue? Began, which is this model, was not able to do that. Okay, so um, I'm gonna quickly go over one more paper where we did a very similar thing. Um, so, you know, we could say, what does it look like for an image to turn more white or zoom, um, zoom in or out? But what if we want to ask something that we don't know what it actually looks like? What if we want to ask, what does it look like to, you know, make an image become more memorable? I don't know what that transformation looks like. Uh, but here's, here's a, tr a trick where we can actually visualize what it looks like. Um, and the way you can do that um, is as follows. And this is work that we presented at ICCV in 2019. This is the Gamma Lice paper with Lore and Alex. Um, so we took um, data on how memorable different photos are. We got this from some old work that we had done. Uh, so some images people remember well and some they don't remember well. And we can just visualize, let's say, uh, which images people remember and which they forget. Uh, here are a bunch of dogs and the ones toward the right and toward the bottom are more memorable according to human judgments. Uh, but as you can see, it's pretty messy, pretty hard to tell what's going on by just looking at the raw data. So can we look at the data in GAN space and get a better sense of what's going on? Uh, and the way we do it is we take our Z vector, we uh, generate an image from that Z vector, and then we assess the memorability of that image using a classifier or a regressor that's been trained to predict how likely it is that a human will remember that image based on our um, training data of these memorability scores. Uh, and then we can try to modify Z to produce an image that goes toward that area of high memorability. Okay, so uh, we simply can walk in a line again in latent space um, such that we increase or decrease the memorability, the predicted memorability of an image. And here's what the result looks like. Um, it takes this panda and to make it more memorable, it thinks that that means zooming in on the panda. And to make it less memorable, it's kind of zooming out. And you can now mine through the data and see a lot of interesting properties. So one property that comes out is you always zoom in in order to make the image more memorable. Um, another one is that uh, you can take an image and if you make it more symmetric or circular, that tends to increase its um, predicted memorability. Uh, we also tested that these images to the right are indeed more memorable in psychophysical experiments. Uh, so simpler images tend to be more memorable. If you blur out the background, it makes it more memorable. And there's some things that we didn't quite know how to quantify, but I think that they might exist. So making a dog more cute and expressive with these bright eyes kind of makes it more memorable. Okay, uh, you can do this on you know, whatever attribute you, you want. If you have data about some image attribute, uh, you can train a model to predict that attribute. And then you could say, you know, what would it look like for a car to become more popular on Instagram? So maybe think about that and, you know, it makes it into a sports car. Or what does it look like for a dog to become more emotion, uh, emotionally positive uh, and it makes it more colorful and uh, kind of happy looking? Okay, so just to summarize, um, there's more details in all these papers, but the idea is that one of these generative models that maps from some well-organized latent space is a way of kind of visualizing data as a continuum. And um, we can learn about the data distribution and its properties by navigating in that latent space. Okay, thank you. And maybe there's time for a question, but I know this is pretty short. Oh, I see there might be some chats. Uh, thank you, Philip. Um, I think we'll uh, move the questions to the yep. Q&A session later, because we're a bit over time. Okay. Um,
Um, so also, I, I won't be at the Q&A session, um, so, but feel free to, I'll try to check the chat later and feel free to message me. Okay, that works, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Killian maybe can start sharing his screen and I'll meanwhile introduce. So, Sounds good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, Killian is a professor at Cornell University in the Department of Computer Science and uh, he has been working with a lot of applied machine learning and Gaussian processes with uh, like many projects ongoing in uh, even national language processing and vision. He's also associated with a startup called ASAP, which works in data augmentation and NLP uh, problems. So today's talk I, it, it will be on uh, feature normalization. So I guess now Clean can take the stage. All right. Can you see the screen? Can you just? Uh, yeah, maybe now you can share. Okay, awesome. Good. Uh, thanks for holding this workshop. Thanks for the invitation. I'm Killian. What I'm presenting today is uh, really work by Boyi Boy and Felix, two students that I'm co-advising research. And uh, we also got help here from Sernam from Facebook Research. And so, yeah, as was just said, you know, I'm talking about feature normalization and data augmentation. And um, feature normalization goes actually way back. So, you know, so, sorry, maybe you have a new... we, can, we oh. can't see your uh, screen. Oh, shoot, shoot. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe try, um, try again. Yeah. Wait, what am I sharing then? Um, nothing. Nothing is being shared, shared yet. Yep. Can you? Yes. Okay. Wait, what can you... Are, are you seeing it now? Are oh, you seeing the I'm wrong screen? Seeing, yeah, yeah, it's fine now. Are you seeing the, the, the two slides or just one slide? One slide, yeah. Okay, good, all right, good. So I'm the guy on the right, the two on the left are the students, they did all the work. Um, all right, so feature normalization. And feature normalization really goes back all the way to the early days of neural networks. In fact, uh, the earliest, Maybe there's a paper before that, but in 1998, Jan LeCun had a paper on efficient backprop, which is actually a great paper to read. And back then, basically, he and his co author said, you know, when you train a neural network, you should always normalize your features because it really helps optimization, et cetera. Um, that was 1998. Back then, neural networks were very short, didn't have many layers. Since then, of course, we have much, much bigger neural networks. And so it makes sense to normalize not just the beginning, but actually throughout. It's of course a famous paper uh, on batch norm that essentially um, suggests exactly this. And nowadays, you know, there's no network anymore that's not trained without feature normalization. It's a really, really big part of kind of the breakthrough of neural networks or deep learning as we call it. <clears throat> and why is this? Um, well, number one, it generalizes much better. So if you maybe have the training curves of a neural network um, and uh, can people see my mouse? Can I just take that? I guess you can because I'm sharing my screen. So um, uh, here the orange line is a neural network trained with batch normalization. It has much, much higher accuracy than network without batch normalization. But why is it that batch norm is so important? And um, essentially the reason is that it allows you larger learning rates. So if you actually lower the learning rate and just train, you would have to train for longer. So here the red, the green line actually is a neural network uh, with batch norm, but the same learning rate as the red line, that's the network without batch normalization. You see they're essentially identical, right? So if you have the same learning rate, there's really no real benefit from, from normalization. But one thing happens if you increase, this learning rate is very, very small, 10 to the minus four. If I increase the learning rate uh, by orders of magnitudes, then if I don't use batch norm, the network diverges. Whereas if I do use batch norm, I can actually train up to four orders of magnitudes faster. Um, and that's really kind of the, the really, really cool part about normalization. And you can see this actually, you can just, you know, uh, look at the gradients. And if you look at the gradients of a neural network with, with batch norm, they kind of, a nice little Gaussian, right? We basically say they're all kind of concentrated around zero, some are positive, some are negative, And they're kind of, you know, somewhat similar. 
uh, if you don't use batch norm, then you have a few gradients, right, that are massive, right, like orders of magnitudes larger than all the other gradients. And so what happens is that these few gradients basically, you know, dominate the updates and, and kind of, you know, cause the divergence. So batch norm is really, really important. Uh, and so let me just introduce some notation here. So, you know, of course, we all know how this works. So we have a confnet, we have an input image of this cute cat. It generates features. So these are different channels. And um, just to make things simpler, <clears throat> we don't have to draw all these cats. We actually just imagine we kind of vectorize each one of these, these features, right? So each one of these activations. So we kind of now have a vector for each channel. And this vector is, has as many dimensions as this is, you know, the height and the width multiplied. So if this is 100 by 100 feature map, then this is a 10,000 dimensional vector. And so this is essentially the feature matrix that I'm generating with my neural network. Of course, I don't just have one image during training. I always use a mini batch, so I have a whole bunch of images. And so each one of them generates this matrix. I can put them together, and now I have this feature block. And this feature block is neat because it can now illustrate very nicely what batch normalization does. In batch normalization, you essentially take the features, and all these green features that I'm highlighting, you actually average them. So in this case, basically, you know, you the, the uh, mean is essentially you average out the position and you average out the mini batch, right? And so this is the mean that you get and you get the standard deviation. And what you do is you just throw them away, essentially. And the new features that you obtain are basically uh, normalized zero mean and standard deviation one. And of course, then you learn a new scale for these features, a new offset. Um, <clears throat> the reason I'm, I'm introducing this, this notation is because it makes it very clear what other alternatives there are to batch norm. And so, for example, you can use instant norm instead. And instant norm, essentially, what does it do? It does uh, <clears throat> normalizes not over the uh, uh, mini batch. It just normalizes over the position. So this is what you get here. Uh, you can have projected <clears throat> a different, only in a top-down dimension. <clears throat> Group norm, what do you do here? You essentially uh, do the same thing as instant norm. But you're also uh, uh, normalizing across multiple channels. And layer norm. What do you do? You normalize, <clears throat> again, across different channels and the position. And so this made us realize, and it's really Boyi and Felix who realized, is that um, essentially all of these normalization techniques normalize over the position, right? So they average out the position of the feature. But that's curious, right? Because the position of the feature is actually very, very important information. So can't be people come up with a normalization scheme that actually respects the position, and that's what we call positional norm or PONO in short. And essentially what we're doing is we are uh, proposing to normalize like, uh, across the horizontal dimension. So we're basically saying, okay, don't, you know, don't touch the position, right? And actually also don't touch the mini bash. Just actually when you have an image, just basically average out the uh, different activations. So just formalizing this, the mean is essentially you go over all the, the features and you average out the channel and the same thing for the standard deviation. I can illustrate this with cute cat pictures. Here we have this cat. We make these different, you know, these are the channels that we're getting. And essentially what you're doing is you average these channels, right? And this is what you get, right? You get the, you know, average feature cat. And this is in the first layer, second layer, and so on. This is in the last layer. And um, below is the standard deviations. And one thing that's really, really cool about this way of doing normalization is that if you look at it, you can actually now see what the neural network is extracting in this layer, right? So, and this hypothesis that neural networks learn low level features early on and high level features uh, later on seems to somewhat, it's consistent with this, that here we actually see is mostly learning an edge detector. See all these kind of different interest points all over the place. In, in the later layers, what you really see is that the face is highlighted and the ears, which presumably are important features for a cat. <clears throat> Okay, so now we can use Pono. Um, and so essentially what we're doing is we, um, we take the image, we extract these, these average features and standard deviation. And so we could just do normalization and you know, throw these away, just like in batch norm, and now have these normalized images. But if we want to do generative learning, right, then actually what we do is you know, we have some kind of UNET structure. Right? We have an image, we kind of learn a low dimensional uh, representation of, you know, a, a lower resolution image um, and then or lower resolution features and then we go back and generate some high resolution image and so you know in some sense 
you know, as I said earlier, right, this is actually the positional information of these features is actually quite important, right? And if you look at this mean, it kind of somewhat captures the essence of a cat, right? There's some information here about the cat that we're throwing away, right? And if we want to later on generate a cat again, we would have to learn this from a lot of data. So one thing we could do is we could actually recycle these, right, and re-inject them later on. And we call this moment shortcuts. So if you basically use Pono, it allows you to use a moment shortcut. So it's basically skip connections, right, or shortcut connections, where you take the, the means from the, the obtain from normalization early on, and instead of throwing them away, you re-inject them later on, right? And so that, you know, supposedly, and, and it does, makes it easier to generate images again. And of course now, you know, that's an obvious thing you can now do is you can say, well, instead of just taking the mean as it is, we can also <clears throat> actually run a little conf net and uh, change it to adapt it to whatever task you're trying to do if you actually want to modify this cat and generate something that's slightly different. Um, you have a little, you know, here's an, an example of multimodal image to image transformation um, where we actually, you know, if you just, we didn't, have, we didn't transfer full data sets, we changed on a smaller data set. And if you just basically try to learn, you know, uh, use this method to try to learn the, um, a cat with the pose of a dog and the dog with the pose of a cat, um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work naively. You know, if you have a lot more data, it looks a lot better. But um, if you just use, make this one change where you actually have, you know, in this case, you have a data set that's slightly too small, but you actually in, insert Pono with moment shortcuts, then actually the results are, you know, lot, look a lot better. And the reason is because you're actually capturing a lot of information, right? You don't actually have to learn what the mean, what the standard deviations are um, from scratch. And in fact, what we are doing here, we are actually, um, <clears throat> taking the, you know, we can actually reinsert the mean from a cat into a dog and so on, right, to actually generate these kind of uh, images. Um, you know, we, we also tried this on, on Psychogans, you know, which famously Philip, who just talked, uh, introduced, and, and you can get uh, uh, improvements. But actually, what, what's, let me just focus on some, some paper that just came out, which I think is really, really cool. It actually really shows the, the advantage of Pono with, with uh, you can get. So here, this is a paper that's, I think, just at CVPR. And this year, you know, you basically have sketches and you try to basically generate um, images with some exemplars. So you want to have the sketch and you fill it in with Steve Jobs, etc. cetera. And um, here in this case, uh, they use it with and without Pono and you can see that, po oh, sorry, you see it on the right. But actually, uh, Pono makes a huge difference here. So actually here, they isolate this. You have an exemplar image. I would like to generate a cockpit that someone has a shape. And the Pono regularization really makes a huge difference here in uh, easing your learning, right? So basically, in some sense, I'm putting in some, some prior information and saying, well, this, this, I'm capturing the structure of an image by um, com computing the first and second moments of the features. And so that will be useful later on when I'm actually generating something. All right, so that, that was um, Pono normalization, but we're not done yet. Um, Turns out you can also use this for data augmentation. And so um, data augmentation, again, just like normalization, goes way back. Um, there's actually a paper by, on vicinal risk minimization. First, Vapnik 99 mentioned it, and then uh, Chappelle et al. with Vapnik together explored it um, in 2001. And the idea is essentially, and you all know this, right, that when I have a sample, I don't just want the minimize the loss, you know, where the sample is, but actually, kind of in its vicinity, right? So around the sample, it should actually, you know, I should actually make the same prediction. And so traditional things are, of course, resizing the image, you know, cropping um, or horizontal flips, et cetera. And most things are invariant to horizontal flipping. These are called label preserving data augmentation. So essentially what I'm saying is I'm, you know, if I'm making these transformations, the label of the image should not change. Uh, lately, there's been a trend to, um, towards label perturbing data augmentation, which essentially says, uh, actually, I want to go further than that. I don't just want to say, okay, around the image that I have, the label should be the same. I also want to go in a certain direction. And so, for example, what you can do is you can take an image of a cat and an image of a plane, and you can mix them, right? And so this is mix, mix up and cut mix. We basically say, well, if I combine these two images, then the classifier should predict something in between, right? It shouldn't just predict, you know, uh, suddenly chair, right? I'm clearly between um, a, a plane and a cat, so somehow I want to linearize, so smooth out this decision surface. And um, so I also know something, you know, what's going on between these samples. This is also something 
that Philip was, was uh, alluding to earlier on uh, in his, his talk just now. Uh, <clears throat> and so when we thought about this, we actually realized, well, actually, we're doing something very similar with Pono, right? So in Pono, we actually take these images and we extract the first and second moments, right? And then later on, we can re-inject them if we have a generative task. Um, but one thing we could actually do is we can take two different images uh, that have nothing to do with each other, and they're totally random, and extract the first and second moments in the feature space. Um, so here we have the average plane features, here we have the average cat features. And then instead of injecting them, we actually swap them, right? So that's basically to say, okay, so what we are learning here is essentially we have a cat and we have to be, make the features zero mean and then we add the mean from the plane, right? So now it's cat features, but they are translated, translated to you know, the space with, to the average uh, location where usually planes are. Um, and you also multiply them as standard deviations the same way. And then we also change the label here on the right. Um, instead of just making cat, we actually say, well, it's a little bit of cat and a little bit of plane, right? Where lambda is some trade off. Uh, <clears throat> and the reason this works, like this should work and it does work, is essentially that when I'm training a classifier, there's many different ways of, you know, recognizing this as a cat and uh, many different ways of recognizing this as a plane. And so, you know, in once, for example, the blue sky could just be enough, right? If all my data points in my, se in my data set um, have, you know, if planes have blue sky, then the network will just learn blue sky and say it's a plane, right? Because cats rarely have a blue sky, are flying in the, in, uh, somewhere in the sky. Um, so what we're doing here is essentially by, by subtracting, getting this mean, we're losing a lot of information, we're keeping the structure of it. And if you inject them into the cat, right, the cat essentially only has this, these, the structure of the plane, right? And so it has to predict a little bit of plane at the end. So really what we're doing is we're learning two different classifiers, right? So one that's basically on the features and one that's actually on the moments. And the first one should classify cat, the second one should classify plane. During test time, we are essentially running both of them simultaneously, right? And so on average, if you kind of ensembling, we have two different views that you're combining. Um, we can try this. So uh, here we have different network architectures. Um, and uh, you can see the baseline here is using standard data augmentation, like flipping, cropping, etc. cetera. Uh, the blue one is when we add moment exchange, as we call it, uh, to it. And you see a very consistent drop in error rate um, here on, on Cypher 10. That same thing holds for other data sets. Um, one thing, by the way, this doesn't just, there's nothing specific about images here. You can actually exchange these features also for NLP tasks and so on. And we also did this, that's all in the paper. Um, we can also, there's really, we don't have to use Pono. If you use any normalization technique, you can just exchange the mean and the standard deviation that we subtract from which direction doesn't matter. Um, as long as it doesn't go over the mini batch. So we can use layer norm, instance norm and group norm. Um, turns out, but these images, Pono seems to be working the best. Um, but for NLP and, and some other tasks, uh, the jury is still out. And finally, how does it stack up with other data augmentation methods that are also <coughs> pairwise? And so here, uh, <coughs> baseline is essentially just standard data augmentation. And we use these, you know, and so we, we tried the various uh, different recent publications. Uh, Moex does very well compared to them. Um, there is, however, one method that is better, that's Cutmix. So Cutmix is slightly better than, than Moex. But the cool thing is Cutmix actually operates completely in the image space, so in the pixel space. We basically cut out some part of the image and paste it in the other one. So you can just combine that with Moex, right? You can use both. Uh, and if you do that, um, because Moex is complete in the feature space, they don't interfere with each other, then actually you get a new state of the art in terms of feature augmentation. Okay, good. So. The summary, um, essentially my main point is feature normalization augmentations are really, really important. We introduced Pono, uh, positional normalization, which normal, normalizes across channels for each position independently. Um, Pono allows two really cool things. Um, the first one is moment reuse. So when you extract these moments, you can then re-inject them later on. That really helps for you know, generative tasks. And the last one is, uh, second one is moment exchange. We actually extract the moment of one image and stick it into, basically re-inject it in another image. And <clears throat> this helps a lot in generalization. And 
the cool thing is this is really, really simple, right? This is literally one line of code, right? <clears throat> we actually have the pseudo code in the paper. So, you know, it works really well. This, um, you know, try it out. That's all. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Kevin, for this exciting talk. Yeah, do so... you, uh, wait, I should stop sharing. Do you, do you want your questions or do you want to do that at the end? At, at the end would be preferable, so. Okay. So I'll introduce our next speaker, Puneet Dokanya. So he's a senior researcher at University of Oxford and he's working in the Tor Vision Group. He's also associated with a startup on self-driving cars called 5AI. And most of his work has been in semantic segmentation and like transfer learning, even generative adversarial models, some applications in language processing as well. So maybe Puneet can start sharing his screen. I, I cannot see. All right, uh, I'll, I'll actually let me share my screen first. Can you? Yep. Okay. Great. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizer for the invitation. Uh, so, today I'm going to talk about. Uh, improved generalization of machine learning, specifically deep learning models using stable and normalization. Uh, and this, this is a joint work with Amartya and Pritol. So before we begin, let's have a very quick look at the definition of generalization. So let's say that uh, the, we are given a data distribution and the objective is to learn a function that maps input x to y and we want to do this very accurately. And this is exactly what we try to do in machine learning, right? However, the data distribution is normally unknown. For example, if you take uh, images for image classification, we don't know the underlying data distribution of the natural images, but we do see them around. And therefore, even if we don't know the data distribution, we know how to sample from it. So that is exactly what we do. We first collect the trained data and approximate the joint distribution using uh, a train data set and try to learn a function by minimizing some loss uh, under this data distribution. Now, once we have done that, we would also like to uh, quantify how well this function that we have learned using the train data actually performs when uh, exposed to a new data. Uh, coming from the same uh, joint distribution field. To do that, that, that is exactly when the generalization gap idea comes into play. So under this setting, uh, we define generalization gap as the difference between the expected loss over the data distribution minus the loss over the tree data. Now, as I mentioned before, this data distribution is unknown. So we approximate this, uh, this using again, a uh, test set. So we sample another test data from the data distribution. And this inequality is obvious because this test data is a subset of the data distribution. And uh, what we try to do is to uh, make sure that the test data is very different from the thing. And this is exactly what the generation gap is. And uh, once we have defined this gap, now it's very obvious that we want to learn functions that will have no generalization. Because we want to learn functions that once trained on trained data, perform very well on unseen test data. And the question is, can we actually uh, come up with some properties of a function that would actually uh, guide us, that would tell us whether this family of function is going to actually give you better generalization properties or not. So now let's take an example of neural networks. And it is like very uh, intuitive and it's very obvious to understand that there are so many factors playing a role to impact the generalization gap. For example, suppose I use uh, an optimization algorithm, like different optimization algorithms will give me different uh, optimal solution. And each optimal solution, or each set of parameters will have different properties. And let's say different norm, different rank, and all these different factors will play a very important role when it comes to generation gap. There are many other 
factors like learning rate, hyperparameter. So even though like there are so many factors playing role in the generation gap, there are really nice recent theoretical papers talking about bounds of this generation gap. These are theoretical bounds, have many parameters, many obvious factors that play a very important role, but they are of very little practical implication. So there are tons of papers out there, but the bounds, they don't actually uh, match the real generation gap. And uh, they, they don't tell us much when it comes to you know, improving uh, generalizability of a model. So what we do here is, like we say that can we actually look into these generation bounds and at least say, see if there is something that can guide us to define a family of function that will like, you know, give us some confidence of having better generalization. So what we do is we look into a really nice recent paper by Bartley and Neshavur in two different papers, but they, they have, if you look into the generalization bound, there is an upper bound. And what we do, we look into only the parameter dependent terms over there. We ignore, we, uh, ignore all other factors playing role in the generation bound. We say that, okay, let's assume that all other factors are kept constant, like the same as people actually uh, use in the standard training process and only look into the parameter dependent factors. So these factors turn out to be actually uh, these two terms. So the first term is the product of the spectral norm of each linear layer. So if there is there are n linear layers, it's, this is the product of the spectral norm, where spectral norm is like the maximum single value. And the second term is sum of something called Stevarac. So it's the ratio of the square of Frobenius norm, or there is a square sign in the serial, and the ratio of the uh, ratio of the square of the Frobenius norm to the spectral norm. So let's have a close look into uh, what this is actually, what this tells us. So the first term, if you look into the first term, is exactly the Lipschitz upper bound, and this is what the spectral norm GAN paper is being the Miyato paper. They actually, what they're doing is they, they do spectral normalization of each linear layer. And by doing that, they are kind of, uh, you know, decreasing the upper bound, the Lipschitz upper bound of the uh, network. And that has, that is directly related to the, uh, one of the, this is a, uh, one of the factor in the theoretical upper bound for the generation gap. Now, since we know that spectral norm is extremely successful, it's being used quite a lot these days, but if you observe it very carefully, this upper bound is extremely loose because it's data independent. It doesn't depend on data at all. And so even though there is an upper bound, Lipschitz upper bound, there are a lot of assumptions over there. And, uh, but it works very well. So what we ask ourselves, uh, now, if you look into the second question part, this part. So this is the ratio of this, uh, it's the sum of the stable ranks, which is the ratio of the Frobenius norm square divided by spectral norm. And this is a very uh, known quantity. It's, it's a proxy to rank, it's upper bounded by rank K, because if all the similar values are same, then this will be exactly same as the rank of the matrix. And it is, it controls noise sensitivity. There are many nice properties of this stable rank. Now, we actually try to answer this question. What happens if we jointly optimize these two things? Because we have seen that one, if we optimize one factor uh, in like spectral norm GAN paper, it works very well. But there are other factors playing role in the generation bound. Can we actually, if we optimize all of them together, then can we obtain something which has better generation properties? And this is exactly what we do. Uh, so let's have a look into the formal definition of the stable rank normalization problem. So mathematically, this is how we define it. So let's say that W is the parameter of a linear layer given to you. What we want to do is to find a W hat, which is closest to the given W in terms of Frobenius distance, such that the stable rank of the W hat is the desired stable rank, R. We also put another constraint. We make the problem more general and put another constraint, which we call spectrum preservation constraint. This constraint is saying that 
make this table run R while ensuring that the top k singular values are exactly the same for both the matrices W and WK. So you can always put k equals to zero. That will actually remove this constraint. You can have k equals to one, you can have k equals to two, depending on the problem at hand. Right? So this is the problem that we want to solve. However, uh, the, the solution is not straightforward and I'll give you reasons why. Since stable rank is the ratio of the two norms, which is Frobenius and the spectral norm, you cannot just simply normalize and do stable rank normalization because they are the same. If, you, if I divide the matrix W by, by sub, suppose theta, the stable rank will remain the same. So I can't do something similar to spectral normalization where I simply find the maximum similar value and divide the matrix by that. And that also is not an opt optimal solution to spectral normalization, but that is what we do in practice. That this also cannot be done similar to Frobenius normalization. So we need a proper way of doing it. Also, for k equals to zero, this problem is non convex So what we want now is to find a solution to this problem with these difficulties that we have just seen. So the, the solution, the theorem and everything is given in the paper all the proof and everything, how we find the optimal solution to this problem. Here I'll give you the intuition, what's actually happening. So this is the algorithm. This, uh, you don't have to go into the details, I'll tell you what's happening here. Okay. So let's say that, that uh, so we are doing this for k equals to one for the time being. So given a matrix W, we can always write it as this first matrix, which is corresponding to the maximum singular value. So U1, V1 transpose, sigma. So we know this uh, thing that W can be written as summation of sigma i, U i, V i transpose, right? So what I'm doing here is simply saying that, okay, take this first term from here and the we can write it as like the first term and the remaining, right? So the algorithm, what it's doing is it first we are doing the spectral normalization of the first term. And for the second term, the algorithm theorem says that find an eta. So we find eta using the solution of theorem one. The final matrix is then this, which is already spectrally normalized, plus eta times w hat. And this is the solution that we obtain. So all the details are in the paper, but computationally, it is exactly same as we inspect the normalization because what we do is we also perform power iteration. We have the spectral normalization because there is a constraint that is uh, over the spectral norm. And then there is extra part that is only to find out the eta. And while doing, when we do that, we find the final matrix WF, which is spectrally normalized and has desired state. So intuitively, this is what it's doing. If you take, suppose W is the given matrix, the first one, and I'm writing two and three as the, let's say there are two singular values. So this is how we represent the singular values. The first, the spectral norm will just divide everything by three because that is the sigma max. And it will make the top one one and the two will become two by three, which is like very obvious. So this is what spectral norm will do. And the stable rank normalization will actually multiply this two by three with a factor eta, which is less than, which we prove is always comes out to be less than equals to one. So basically it's again, so spectral norm reduced some direction through which information could propagate. And this is reducing it further. So in one sense, we are learning, uh, you know, more robust mappings because if a lot of similar values are reduced, then if, you, if there is a uh, noise in the input, a lot of direction of the noise will cancel out. So that is how the, these normalizations work. So this is what stable rank normalization is doing in the end. And the, the entire inspiration comes from looking at the theoretical results that are being given recently and only working on the parameter dependent quantities. So now let's have a look into how this works in practice. So what we do is we, uh, try stable rank normalization into two problems, two set of problems. One is the classification experiments and another GAN experiments. So in case of classification experiments, what we show is that SRN, while providing good generalization, it also has this uh, less memorization of property. 
So this is one way we can actually say that this is working well. Another way to quantify would be that uh, we also compute some recently proposed complexity measures and we see how, we how well different normalizations are doing in that. So the first set of experiment is this. So the top one is the clean data accuracy. So this is the test accuracy on the clean data, higher is better. So we try different like ResNet, wide ResNet, LXNet, everything on CEPHAR 100. And interestingly, if, so this is vanilla. If you apply spectral norm, the performance drop, and that is that can be the reason why people don't use the spectral normalization for the classification problems. They are primarily used in uh, GANs, right? Even though there is a paper that says that uh, spectral normalization, so the earlier paper of Niyato and Yashita, uh, spectral normalization improves generalization. But so this is what we see when we use spectral norm in practice. So generally, in some cases, but in case of LXNet, the results are not the same, but this is like widely used. The moment we apply stable rank normalization, we see improvement. So it's in a way like improving us further. So it's kind of fixing what is being done by spectral norm in one sense. So these are the results when it comes to test data accuracy. Now if we take the same model, exactly the same, and do the shattering experiment where you randomly shuffle all the labels of the train data. And in order to have good train accuracy in this shattering experiment, the model has to memorize because sometimes you're saying that this is cat and the next time the data is saying the cat is dog. And this is happening very frequently. So the only way a model can actually do very well is by memorizing. So that means if the train, so in this case, if the train accuracy is low, it indicates less memorization. So we see that in case of stable rank normalization, the train accuracy is always low. So, so the conclusion here is that like the same model with the stable rank normalization performed very well on the test clean data. And when it came to shattering experiment, it, the train accuracy was low. So while giving good generalization, it's like having less memorization. Now, what else can we actually quantify to find out the, the sum of the properties of the function that we have learned. So some complexity measures, I won't go into the details. These are like recent papers uh, in which there are different parameter dependent complexity. So these, they depend on parameter and data as well. Uh, complexity measures that uh, uh, these authors have proposed. And like, for example, uh, they sometimes transform to, uh, you can say, um, like they, they, they quantify robustness. Like if you, if you look into the, uh, this particular term, so this is saying that if, uh, how sensitive your parameters are to input noise, because they are some kind of uh, quantifying ellipsis, yes, right? So these, all these uh, complexity measures, lower the better, that is, so we, we plot the histogram for all of them and we observe that with this, the stable rank, so vanilla is always higher, like this is with no normalization at all. And the spectral has improved the vanilla, so it has lower, but then when you use the stable, it's like further below on the left side. So this is on the classification experiments. Now we turn to GAN experiments. Now the question is why should SRN make sense in case of GANs? So again, we, we only focus on the discriminator of GAN, it's a binary classifier. So most of the things that we have seen for the classification problems like the theoretical bound should actually be applicable, applicable here as well. Also, like a lot of people talk about uh, this tension between capacity and generalizability of discriminator. So uh, a discriminator, so from high level, a discriminator should have enough capacity so that it can distinguish between real and fake, but should be simple also in order to generalize well. But if there is the trade-off is not maintained, then uh, so you always have to find a trade-off. So if we see the recent work, like the Wasserstein GAN, this is like suggesting that, okay, have a low ellipsis discriminator. Then there, so there are different ways of doing that weight clipping, gradient penalty, and there are many, many variants in which it's, it's been shown that if you have a simple family of functions, like low ellipsis, it works better. So that is, and as we have already said that, so 
this is the motivation from the Lipsis point of view. So now we already argued in case of classif classification problems, this might not be good enough. So again, the same logic follows here that if we apply SRA numbers discriminator of GAN, it should provide some improvements uh, in, when it comes to generalization. So for GAN experiments, what yeah, we do- Sorry, with, maybe Puneet, you can like quickly wrap up, like we are running short of time. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, that's fine. So, I mean, I just have one more slide. So in case of GAN experiments, we compute the empirical histograms of the uh, Lipsis, uh, empirical lipsis to in order to compute the empirical lipsis behavior and lower the better. So we, sh we saw that as we decrease the stable rank, the inception score improves. But if you decrease too much, then it collapses completely. That simply shows that the capacity of the discriminator has been uh, dropped down quite a lot. And then when we compare with different variants, we show that the stable rank normalization works better than spectral normalization. Similarly, we show the experiments on uh, neural divergence score that actually kind of, kind of quantifies the memorization in GANs and they are higher the better. So this is what we show when we compare to spectral norm GAN. So I mean, to conclude, we actually uh, used recent uh, theoretical generalization bounds to guide us towards finding something that could actually help us in developing normalization schemes with some guarantees of having improved generalization properties. And that is what we show using uh, spectral stable rank normalization. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Bunis, for the talk. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to take any questions right now. Maybe, maybe later on in the Q and A session. So. Sure. So I'll quickly introduce Hugo. So he's currently leading the Google Brain team in Montreal. He's also associated with Mila, and he was also. Uh, affiliated to University of Sherbrooke and has previously worked at Twitter. His work spans uh, generative modeling and applications of deep learning in language classification, text classification, vision, and he was also a program chair for NeurIPS in 2019. So maybe Hugo will take the stage now. Yep. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Um, let me try to stop, stop sharing. I know it went away. Do yep. people see my screen right now? Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I'll try to keep it as short as possible since we're running a bit out of time. I want to leave some time for Emily also to uh, give her talk. Uh, and this is very much kind of work in progress, not entirely perfectly well formed ideas uh, that I thought I would. Uh, submit to you in this short talk, uh, which is about evaluating generative models using uh, ideas and benchmarks from QShot Learning. And this uh, was derived from some experiments and work that I did with Eleni uh, Tugantapilou, an intern at Brain, and Vincent Dumoulin is a research scientist at Brain as well. Um, I, I thought I'd start by describing a little bit where I come from in terms of the sort of uh, line of work in generative models. Uh, when I started my PhD in the mid 2000s, um, I, uh, which is kind of when the resurgence of interest in neural nets started uh, and in deep learning, uh, I was fairly actively working on Rick Sister Bolson machines. Um, uh, many of you might not know what these are or remember these. Uh, if you do, you're probably in your 30s at least, or maybe Canadian. Um, but uh, we were really interested in, this was kind of the prototypical generative model based on neural networks. And we were kind of evaluating how useful they are, uh, not necessarily based on samples, but actually based on how useful they were to provide an initialization that was based on unsupervised learning for deep neural nets. Um, however, this is not really used anymore. Uh, what's used much more, we essentially became much better doing regular supervised learning with deep nets. Uh, by you know, using batch norm and dropout for better regularization and better optimiz optimizers like Adam, data augmentation, and so on. Um, but I continued working in generative models, and in particular, I proposed neural autoregressive distribution estimators, or NAID, which uh, again, maybe uh, you know, this has been a while this, I published this work, maybe some of you don't remember uh, this work so much. Um, but it was partly motivated by the fact that these models, uh, a bit like um, as uh, Oriol presented, 
allowed for computing the exact log probability under the model of test data. And it was really great to have a quantitative way that was directly related to the generative model to get some form of, of metric for its performance. But when you think about whether that's a good metric, really the main way of motivating uh, log, average log probability of a test set as a metric is that you would, I guess, care to about compressing the test set um, uh, in term, and know in terms of number of bits that would be required to do that using your model. The reality is we rarely do that at all, compression. Uh, and, and especially when you're interested in the AI applications, you're really mostly thinking about learning representations or, or, and solving specific tasks. And so I've sort of been still somewhat involved in some research in generative models, but I've kind of moved to other things. And one of the particular problem that I've moved to uh, more recently in the past, I don't know, something like two years, um, is uh, few shot learning. Uh, that is trying to solve problems that look like this, where we have a classification problem here. It's a five-way classification problem. We have one image per class, uh, and uh, which is very little data to be able to train a classifier and be able to classify properly examples in a test set. And really, that's the reason I was interested in generative models as a form of unsupervised learning which could leverage unlabeled data, and maybe that would be key for relying less on labeled data to solve certain AI-related problems, like perception problems, like image classification. Um, and so I've been really interested in, in trying to address this problem more directly, and I'll, I'll see how maybe this can connect back to generative models later. Um, but essentially, in the past few years, there's been a lot of progress in two-shot learning uh, research and models, uh, and the way that we move the needle and, and, and have success in few shot learning is a little bit how we would have success for regular supervised learning to have a hope that we can generalize well to new test examples. Well, in supervised learning, we hope that we can have a lot of available labeled examples. And for few shot learning, we're interested in the ability of generalizing to new classification tasks. So what we will try to do is to actually simulate and collect as many other few shot learning tasks that a few shot learning model will be trained on and then evaluated on new, different few shot learning tasks at uh, evaluation or test time. Um, there's been a fair number of benchmarks proposed. One of the largest out there right now is Metadata Set. This is work that uh, I've been involved in, and uh, Eleni Tigantampilou is the lead author. She's actually presenting this right now at uh, the fourth poster session, which is currently ongoing. And she'll also be presenting in the fifth session of the day. So if you're interested in learning more, go check out her five minute presentation and then go. Uh, discuss it in the poster session uh, uh, to learn more about this. But uh, essentially, Metadata Set provides for a bunch of few-shot classification tasks for training a few-shot learner, and then defines also a set of test few-shot classification tasks to evaluate your few-shot learner. So you're a learner that can take in a small training set for a task and produce a classifier that can be applied on the corresponding test set for that same task. And, um, and key for having a good few-shot learner is uh, to have a lot of different few shot learning tasks that we can train on. And so in metadata set, what we aim is to try to have as rich as possible a, a training set of tasks, as well as a test set of tasks for evaluation of few shot learning research. And to do this, we leverage a bunch of publicly available and, and a variety of publicly available data sets available for image classification in general. OmniGlot, ImageNet, Aircraft, VGG Flower, QuickDraw, Traffic Signs, and so on. Uh, and what we do is we leverage those available um, uh, sources of data in order to generate few shot classification tasks for training and for evaluation. And the way we construct the benchmark is we make sure that the test set of tasks correspond to classes of objects or animals and so on that are strictly different from those that we use for training. So really are interested in generalizing, but in the space of task, of classification tasks. And so since uh, naturally, intuitively, the key would be to generate as many tasks for training, then one of the things we started thinking is, can we somehow augment the amount of classification tasks that we can train on, not by directly only rel relying on, on available data sets? And this is where the idea of using generative models came about, and we started exploring that. Um, so specifically, if we have a model like BigGAN, a little bit like what Oriol explained, and, and quite related to his NERIPS paper on using classification of models trained on generated data, we, can, uh, we were interested in, in trying to do this also for few-shot learning tasks. Uh, that is, we would take a big GAN model, train on ImageNet, say, 
And then we would generate a bunch of new synthetic examples by feeding in the one hot label of say, any one of the thousand classes from ImageNet, like remote control, feeding in a noise vector for each image we want to generate. And then we get new examples from this synth synthetic class that comes from Big Gan that, that we can use then to generate new few shot learning tasks from uh, infinitely num uh, uh, an infinite number of, of these synthetic images. Um, and this might actually work better because there's more data to create synthetic tasks for. Uh, and maybe the big GAN model or any generative model would have learned something that uh, uh, the factors of variation within classes, but also that are shared across classes. Uh, though we've seen from Philip's talk that this seems actually to be somewhat challenging to do. Um, but another thing we thought we could do that's uh, not been mentioned so far, and that's really interesting for few shot learning is that perhaps we can actually create some new classes uh, by uh, manipulating what we feed as the class definition or the vector that defines the class to the big GAN model. And in particular, one thing that we played with was let's take the interpolation of uh, two one hot vectors for two different classes and use that as defining a new sort of mixed class. So in this case, we took uh, half of the uh, violin class, essentially, and half of the barracuda class, which is a fish. Uh, so we, we took the interpolation between these two one-hot vectors, and we feed that to the big GAN model. And then we gave the, these somewhat weird images of either someone playing a fish or holding a violin. Uh, and, and then we just say, well, let's, let's consider that as a new class that we invented. Uh, from which we can get examples to create new few shot learning tasks that we can train a, uh, a few shot learner. And so we started playing with this idea, see if it had leg, and, and some of the results are, are quite interesting. Uh, so what you're seeing here is each row corresponds to a different test set of tasks where the images come from different sources of data, traffic sign, aircraft, and so on. And then each column is a different source of data from which we created the few shot learning tasks to train on a, a meta learner or a, a few shot learner. And in particular, we use a prototypical network, which I won't describe here, but just think of it as this is a type of learner for few shot learning that is trained on tasks, on few shot learning tasks. And uh, what we found is that uh, if we train on the raw images from ImageNet, the tasks that are generated from it, we get a particular performance. And the performance we get if we instead we use synthetic data generated from a GAN model with the hard label, the true one hot labels, we actually get pretty close performance. Uh, and then if we use the soft labels, we get a slightly better performance that is not quite at the image net performance, but it's not that far, which is interesting to contrast to what Oriol presented, where the gap was much bigger in the regular supervised learning setting. And this might be because here what we're interested in is generalization to new problems, new classes. We're not measuring generalization also within ImageNet domain, but actually across other domains. So in a sense, it's, it's more challenging, but that means that there might be even more benefit of, of, of learning a generative model instead of just using the, only the true examples. And in fact, then we can actually train on jointly on the original ImageNet uh, classification task and the GAN generated classification task. And we get the best results when we use GAN using these soft labels, which are technically speaking, uh, generating entirely new classes that don't actually exist in ImageNet. They're kind of synth synthetically generated. We're getting uh, an interesting uh, boost from, from doing that. Um, so this is kind of the proposal that I'm submitting for discussion, perhaps during the Q&A or, or uh, offline. Uh, maybe few shot learning benchmarks like metadata set could serve uh, instead of thinking of using generative models to improve few shot learning, maybe few shot learning benchmarks can be used to evaluate the quality of, of generative models where you would look at, well, what happens if instead of a big GAN, I use an SPN or a GLOW model or any new model you would be developing uh, for generating the data that is used to create few shot learning tasks to train on. Uh, and uh, who knows, maybe we can even surpass just from synthetic data, the original ImageNet training procedure, uh, or maybe actually combining all of these data sets together is what's gonna push the boundary of what we can do in few shot learning, which is a really interesting byproduct that this could generate. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, with just mentioning some pros and cons for, for you to think about of doing this approach. Uh, so it's a metric that can work for any generative model Unlike pre-training, pre-training, you really need to do a mapping between your generative model and the weights of a supervised neural net. Uh, 
Here we're working with samples, so, so uh, really any kind of model can be used. It's a metric that one can really care about because it's trying to improve performance on a, what I think is an important problem, which is few-shot learning. Where log likelihood compression is not so much interesting, really, or at least it's definitely not one of the most uh, studied problem in general in machine learning. Um, it might be actually one of, compared, say, to the work that Oriel presented, one of uh, a particularly interesting ways of measuring the uh, performance of compositional generative models that can actually do this kind of uh, uh, generating new class uh, procedure by uh, combining, doing novel combinations of its components to generate data that is really different from what it's been trained on. Uh, and, and this is something that can really be valuable when you're interested in generalizing to new few-shot learning tasks and new, so new object categories that you've never seen before. Um, disadvantages, it really is only usable if you have a conditional generative model, a class conditional generative model. I would say that really generative models are mostly interesting anyways when there are conditional. Uh, uh, unconditional generation is, is, has, I think, much less, much more limited uh, interesting use cases, uh, that's perhaps debatable. And the other thing is that, well, it's not directly assessing visual quality. That is, there's no theoretical reason why we need to generate uh, visually uh, perfect samples to actually get good performance of a few shot learner trained on these samples. So if you're interested, happy to discuss this either in, you know, later in this meeting or uh, offline. Uh, don't uh, hesitate to reach out uh, in the various ways during the conference or offline. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you Hugo, for this amazing talk. Sure. Should we move to the last talk before and we can take questions after? Yes, yes. Cool. All right. So I'll quickly introduce Emily. So you can see my screen, right? I, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So Emily is a research scientist at, at the Google Machine Intelligence Group. She has been working on generative models, but has now also shifted her focus to ethics and bias and algorithmic fairness. So she'll be talking about a very new perspective that most of us do not think of. It's on like critiques in generative AI. And I would also like to thank Emily because she's also attending another conference and she like accepted this invitation at at the last moment so over to you em cool let me see if i can share this okay can you see my slides yep yeah okay awesome cool so um yeah thank you everybody for joining us today and for all the awesome talks so far um and thanks for the organizers for putting this together uh during some pretty challenging times um so yeah i'm emily i'm a research scientist at google brain um in new york city or uh, my living room right now um and so i just want to share a little bit of my research background so you have some more context for this talk right so i sort of started out doing um sort of cognitive science and then moved over um, during my PhD to focus on generative models and supervised learning, a little bit of kind of forward modeling from an RL perspective. Um, but over the course of my PhD, I became increasingly aware of the kind of broader social consequences of AI. Um, and I've now shifted my research focus towards more uh, socio-technically oriented um, AI ethics work. So I'm not currently working on generative models. Um, so when I got this talk invitation, I thought I'd sort of use it as an opportunity to return to the topic uh, of generative models, um, but with this new kind of socio-technical and ethics-oriented lens that I have now. Um, so that being said, this is like, you know, it's kind of thrown together at the last minute. It's really like an, you know, informal musing of my thoughts about some different things, and I hope it's enough to kind of spark conversation. Um, so this talk's going to be split into two parts. Uh, in the first half, I'm going to give a non-exhaustive overview of some risks and harms that have emerged in recent years from generative techniques. Um, uh, so some of these things I think folks are going to be fairly familiar with, um, but I also hope to tread on some new territory or at least some topics that I think um, are so far under discussed in the generative modeling community. Um, and a little bit of a caveat here is that um, I'm going to focus primarily on images and videos, um, both because this is only a 15 minute talk and because that's where a lot of my kind of expertise lies. Um, but a lot of the stuff that I'll say, you can imagine it kind of generalizing to other domains. 
Um, and then the second, uh, uh, oh, also one other thing I want to say here is that the kind of ethical concerns are going to be focused um, in some part on downstream uses of generative techniques, um, sort of on the application level. Um, but I, I am going to kind of argue that, um, you know, this doesn't kind of resolve the generative modeling community, or at least the academic community, from being attentive to these things. Um, and, and other things that I'm going to talk about are going to be more oriented towards the kind of academic work that we're doing and the, and the research papers that we're publishing. Um, and then the second part of my talk will kind of move more into like how we as a field can move forward. Cool. So part one. Um, so I'm just going to begin with the kind of obvious, uh, um, you know, observation that these generative techniques have kind of advanced to a point where they can now be leveraged to create synthetic media that's not immediately identifiable as computer generated. Um, right. So I think we all know right now this can be used to kind of digitally edit um, audio or visual content and make it appear as though a person is saying or doing something they didn't actually say or do. Um, so a multitude of harms can result here, both when an individual consuming the media um, is deceived into thinking that it's authentic, um, and also even when they know that the content has been altered. So, um, you know, some sort of tangible concrete consequences of this, um, right, these techniques could be used to promote or circulate various forms of you know, fake news or misinformation by altering media content to suggest that, for example, a political figure is saying or doing something they didn't say or do. Uh, in some instances, um, this can contribute to an individual consuming uh, and believing that this content is in fact true. Um, then it can also more broadly weaken kind of public trust in news sources and make it difficult for the public to distinguish fact from fiction. Um, and it also affords kind of new route um, of deniability and, and discrediting of evidence. So I think this is, you know, one of the topics that there is a lot of kind of focus on um, and, and folks are also working in this space to kind of detect these kinds of like fake um, videos and, and stuff. Um, so these types of audio and visual manipulation um, have also um, been weaponized in pretty uh, violating and violent ways. Uh, and this has been disproportionately targeting women. Um, so, for example, like deep fake techniques um, can insert faces um, into sexually explicit content uh, without consent of the individuals. Um, and there's different sorts of apps that have been proposed and developed uh, that kind of undress people in images, again, no consent required. Um, and again, these are kind of disproportionately, um, you know, targeting women. Um, and right, so we're kind of regardless of whether, um, you know, the content is mistaken for real or not in these cases, these tools provide a new avenue um, for targeted um, harassment and abuse. Closely related, um, there is this website, uh, these nudes do not exist, that sells algorithmically generated nudes for a dollar each. Um, so this is a male run company that is profiting off of the commodification of, of women's bodies uh, following a very um, sort of similar trend that we that we know. Um, and, and this raises sort of, you know, questions that are actually important, I think, to all ML practitioners to be thinking about relating to how the data was sourced. Um, right, so this, this database, um, the, uh, the, the company owners say that it, you know, it composes um, women, mostly 20 to 40 years old, um, all white. Um, they say they only use public domain images, um, but most pornographic data sets that are in the public domain um, have actually been stolen from sex workers. So this raises a sort of multitude of issues, um, right? Not only have the women who are powering these models um, most certainly not consented to this, um, but they've most likely not been compensated for it. So I want to shift a little bit away from the kind of downstream applications and towards considerations that might um, seem like a little bit more of an immediate concern for this, this field. Um, so generative techniques sort of by design obviously reproduce um, you know, statistical correlations um, in the data set that they were trained on. Um, and I think there is sort of an increased conversation about different types of data set bias and there's been a lot of really interesting work um, sort of looking at how to kind of understand and mitigate biases um, that generative models are trained on. Um, and here I just wanna emphasize the importance of Kind of critically examining data set bias from a social perspective um, and understanding how these correlations might reflect different kinds of social stereotypes or patterns of structural inequality in the world. So I'm going to go through an example with um, Celeb A, which is a pretty standard face data set. Um, and I use this because this is a data set that I've used in the past. And so um, a lot of like my thinking in this field is kind of reflecting back on my own practices and um, you know, how I could have done better or things that I didn't notice, but I'm thinking through now. Um, so some like natural questions to ask about this data set is like who you know, is represented in the data set, who is underrepresented. Um, you know, in Celeb A, for example, there's a lot of sort of demographic skews, for example, 
um, contains predominantly lighter skinned celebrities. Um, you might also ask how are people represented? Um, so in Celeb A, there's really strong correlations between um, certain characteristics, um, certain attributes in the data set. Um, for example, the women in the data set tend to be relatively young and are rarely wearing glasses. Um, so this means that like generative models trained on this data set, um, you know, if they're sort of trained naively, um, are going to, you know, kind of learn a particular model of what this type of person looks like. Um, and so we can also kind of question the values and politics that might be embedded in a particular data set, um, right? With Celeb A, we see a very kind of specific logic that's built into the kind of attribute taxonomy. Um, so we have attributes such as like attractive, male, young, um, you know, these are all sort of far from objective or natural categories. And so these socially relevant biases can manifest um, right in techniques or applications that ultimately end up reinforcing or amplifying um, you know, sexist, racist, or otherwise kind of offensive biases and worldviews. Um, this figure that I show here um, that's sort of manipulating this attractiveness uh, um, dimension of a generative model is actually from a paper um, that is proposing a method to mitigate these types of data set biases. So um, they're not making any claims that this is what an attractive person looks like. Um, but we have actually seen this kind of manifest in, in real applications that, you know, propose beauty filters or hotness filters and have seen, um, you know, for example, that these, these types of filters end up kind of lightening skin tones as, you know, quote unquote, hotness is increased. Um, so again, the risk here is that these kind of generative AI techniques, um, often unintentionally, um, end up reinforcing some kind of normative view of, for example, um, you know, what beauty looks like or what a particular gender looks like, and this in turn can kind of reinforce societal um, expectations and, and norms. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into race and gender briefly. Um, so definitely don't have time for a full kind of gender or racial literacy talk, um, nor do I really think that I'm the best person suited to give such a talk, but I want to convey hopefully enough about this topic to encourage folks to kind of dig in a little bit more on their own. Um, so in short, gender and race are, um, they're social categories, right? They're not kind of fixed attributes attached to people or images. Um, and so they're socially situated, both temporally and spatially, and are, and are thus unstable in a variety of different senses. Um, racial categories in particular are tied to kind of racial projects, and I have a whole other kind of line of research and paper in the algorithmic fairness world kind of looking at the use of racial categories in machine learning. Um, but for now, I'll just say that when they're adopted, as they often are in machine learning, as these kind of fixed and stable attributes that are just attached to people, um, then the kind of social and political dimensions of these categories end up being lost or obfuscated. And this, this in turn um, can kind of contribute to the production um, and reproduction of racial inequality. Um, and also similarly, the kind of reification of normative gender categories, um, which we often see happening in different kinds of machine learning technologies, can also operate in, in similarly oppressive ways. So um, my point here really is that generative models um, of images of people, um, that's what I'm going to focus on primarily, but we can also think about other kinds of signals like speech, signals that are really intimately tied to people's identities. Um, these models can risk reinscribing social categories like race and gender as sort of visual um, and natural attributes. So I'll just give a couple examples of like what I'm talking about here. Um, so something that we've seen very frequently in papers um, about generative models of images is this idea of manipulating images along different sort of latent dimensions. Um, and the notion of gender as a latent dimension is very frequently utilized. Um, so I've kind of just pulled um, an example from a recent paper, um, but this is extremely common. I'm not kind of, you know, flagging this paper over others for any particular reason. Um, and um, so this is something that I, I really, really want to just urge people to think about um, and subsequently kind of speak carefully about. So these kinds of gender swapping methods, um, right, whether it be like an app that anybody is using or just an academic paper that is describing new techniques, um, can really be harmful in a variety of ways. Um, so first, it, it kind of reifies binary gender schematics, um, and it also reduces gender to visual appearance, um, which can hurt a range of people, um, but specifically is likely to hurt trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming, and kind of otherwise gender diverse individuals. Um, and it also kind of reinforces a normative view of what a particular gender looks like. So for example, you know, male filters might shorten hair and add facial hair, and female filters might lengthen hair and add makeup. 
um, which again in turn kind of feeds into these societal expectations. Um, and so generative models, right, they're extremely powerful descriptive tools um, and, and they have great utility for visualizing, understanding complex data, right? We saw this in Philip's talk earlier today. Um, but when we're dealing with categories such as, as gender, um, even if sort of you as a researcher understand that by manipulating the gender dimension of a generative model, you're really just manipulating a set of visual characteristics that in the data set that the model was trained on, you know, might correlate with a particular label in that data set as opposed to some intrinsic property of a person, the manner with which we kind of as academics sort of speak about these things, um, you know, both in our own papers and kind of in broader public discourse um, really, really matters. Um, so there's another line of research that's related to this that I want to touch upon that's focused on generating faces from speech. Um, and so these works um, have a tendency of referring to gender, race, and ethnicity as, as visual properties of faces, um, or sometimes as biophysical parameters. Um, and they speak of producing kind of gender, ethically, or racially appropriate faces from voices, which again kind of reinscribes race and gender as both these natural and visual attributes. Um, and so um, really I wanna bring this up because it emphasizes the importance of understanding the kind of underlying logics um, and um, of the resulting application, how it fits into broader social context. Okay, so I'm running low on time, so I'm gonna kind of rush through the second half of my talk. So um, really, uh, I think that like individual researchers, machine learning field as a whole, we really need to start to kind of seriously reckon with and be held accountable for the kind of far-reaching social consequences of the work that we're doing. Um, and really kind of question, you know, the cultural logics that are embedded in data sets and the resulting techniques that we're producing. So this obviously isn't going to be easy. I think critical and reflexive research practices are things that need to be learned. Uh, and computer science um, as a field as a whole has historically not sort of prioritized or valued these types of methodologies. Um, and really what this is going to require, I think, is shifting kind of culture, norms, and practices. Um, so I'm going to go through a bunch of things that I think um, might get us some of the way. Um, some of these things are going to be things that sort of individual researchers can think about and grapple with, and other things are really going to kind of require these community-wide um, efforts. So the first thing um, is adopting kind of critical data practices. Um, so this is where most of my research these days lies. So if anybody's interested in digging into this more, we can you know, chat during the breakout sessions or, or later. Um, so critical data practices to me mean a variety of different things. So um, really means, you know, kind of questioning and critiquing who is represented in data sets, what kind of statistical correlations might exist in these data sets, and how these correlations might relate to social structures of power and privilege. Um, it also means looking beyond these kind of distributional properties of data sets and also questioning um, the conditions of construction of a given data set, um, what categories might underlie a data set, um, the kind of personal and organizational imperatives that shape the collection of a data set, and really what are the kind of taken for granted um, and shared background of assumptions um, that shape the construction of data sets. Uh, and these points aren't only for data set creators, right? I think, you know, there's a lot of folks who are really just interested in the modeling side of things, really developing algorithmic techniques, and they might just kind of pick and choose a data set, um, you know, that kind of has some property that's relevant for the model that they're developing without a lot of care to like what's contained in that data set. Um, but even if we're, you know, just doing that, every time we kind of uncritically adopt a data set, even for purely research purposes, kind of contribute to that data set being reified as an apolitical scientific object. Um, and many times these data sets have very, very specific kind of political contexts. So I think there's also a role for the community at large to play in terms of shifting reviewing practices and incentive structures and educational efforts. There's one really concrete thing that we as a field um, and also individual researchers can do, um, which is to kind of normalize incentive and incentivize the inclusion of ethical consideration sections of papers, um, comprehensive model and data reporting and documentation frameworks. So I list model cards and data sheets for data sets as two examples. These have come out of, kind of collaborators on my team and they're really, really amazing frameworks. Um, and these, the idea here is these kind of help model and data set developers kind of proactively consider the limitations of their work, uh, kind of detail the assumptions and motivations and do a little bit, a little bit of introspection and reflection. Um, so um, one final thing is to really think about our kind of unique positions in the world and the set of experiences that shape our understanding of the world and limit the bounds of our perspective, um, right? Our kind of positionality um, limits our kind of epistemic worldview and the way in which we see things. 
um, and accepting that we only have like a partial perspective on the world um, is, is really about recognizing how um, you know, people with power and privilege see the world in very different ways than people who are holding different marginalized identities. And so we really need to, you know, kind of educate ourselves, consider diverse stakeholders, and be aware of the limitations in our own perspectives. Um, interdisciplinarity, um, I'll kind of skip this slide just for the sake of time, but um, I think interdisciplinarity is incredibly important. Here's a couple papers that talk about the importance of this. Um, uh, AI is basically fundamentally a social and technical endeavor and our practices need to reflect this. Um, and finally, um, I think we need to shift our thinking from intent to impact. Um, most people I think are really well intentioned and simply might not know the ways in which their work might actually be impacting people. Um, but we are building socio-technical systems and need to be explicitly thinking about the social aspects of our work and engaging with diverse stakeholders um, and kind of actively working to develop these self-critical and reflexive practices. So. I will um, stop there and just thank some of my colleagues who I chat about a lot of this stuff with. Thanks. Thank you so much, Emily.